Thanks, Kevin. So you guys, um, I think we're going to get started. So if you want to like, grab a drink, squeeze in tight, grab a seat. Um, we have Marcy, so I think we're good to go. Should I just go ahead and start? I think you're good. Just go ahead and start? OK. OK. Hello, everybody. This sounds really funny because it's very, is it too loud? OK, I guess we're good. Um, my name is Marcy Campbell. I'm a VP of Solutions Management at a company called Novation. Novation is a company that's been around since 1999. We develop software for kindergarten through 12th grade students. So um, kind of a, a search tool. We um, kind of harvest content from the internet and kind of help schools as they move in that print to digital space. Um, what they wanted me to talk about today was our journey we took through um, customer development in the development of this new product. Um, our company worked with Gaslight in a portion of this development. The development itself or the research of it has been going on for a couple years. And so I kind of just wanted to talk through different stages we went through, but the biggest thing I'm going to keep stressing is get out of the office. Um, I am not trained in UX, but it's something that I'm passionate about and been doing it for about five years. And so um, I'll kind of talk through some of the stuff that we've been doing as we go through that. Um, I love questions. Please feel free to kind of ask away. So I've got some slides up here. Feel free just to read or whatever. Um, I'm not going to read these to you. Um, but the big thing is, um, in my role at Novation, um, I'm in charge of the, um, the portfolio products. And so I started as a developer a long time ago. <laughs> I was a developer for about 14 years. And then as my kids approached um, going into grade school, I got involved with a school, and they asked me to develop their tech plan. So I said, yeah, I'd love to, and got kind of sucked in. And nine years later, I went back to the software company. So for nine years, I worked in a school system, helping them kind of implement their technology structure and, and plans and that type of stuff. And in the process of doing that, I got to really understand what it's like to be a teacher and what's really needed in the classroom. Um, during that time, I purchased a product from Novation to use in our schools. And so I'd say after about six, seven, eight years, I was getting that bug. By nature, I'm a designer, developer. I wanted to get back on the other side. And so I felt passionate about taking the voice of the customer, that customer that was me, bringing it back into the company and figure out how can we begin to push that into the solutions. Because what I was seeing come out in school technology was sorry to say this, but stuff that was typically designed by an engineer. And so I needed to have that voice of that teacher inside there. And it's really hard because we've all been in classrooms, and so you assume you're a subject matter expert. I've been taught before, why can't I just go out and develop software for that? But the classroom is so different today, and when you're in the midst of it, in the time crunch teachers and students are in today, it's a very different dynamics in which um, they need to have the software built. So. Um, there's many UX methods, and so as we've gone through this or whatever, everyone's very aware that there's tons of stuff to use out there. Um, but what typically happens, there's no budget. It's one of the first things that gets cut. You know, we're not going to do this. You know, we know what we need to do, that type of stuff. But I keep um, preaching to the choir that there is a way to creatively do this if you, what I call, employ lean UX on top of an innovation process. So if you've got that lean mindset to constantly be thinking about how can we get out there with that customer, but in a way that's not going to expend a lot of money as we do it. Um, and so as we went through these phases, which I'll take you through, um, constantly thinking how can we immerse ourselves, how can we constantly be observing, and how can we constantly be engaging with these users. Once again, get out of the office. Um, and so the one thing, though, that's very, very important, I've talked to a lot of teams about this. And this is something that when we started working here with Gaslight, it was something that we really could take and push forward. Because what they do is they come together as a team, and we work together as a team. And so what we did the first week that we worked together is we totally debriefed and essentially indoctrinated them into all of the information that we knew about the research we've done so far. And so I told them as we go through this process, as a team, we are going to go out and experience the user. It's not going to be some of us that are at product owner 
stage or some of us that are in you know the salespeople bringing back information it's very I saw it's very very important to get everyone on the team getting that first-hand experience and I'll talk about what we did at one point but having that voice of that student and that teacher in your head when you're sitting around the table with developers and designers makes all the difference in the world instead of us trying to convince come on you got to understand the teacher really wants this when they see that firsthand that that teacher has that pain then when they're creatively thinking about how can I design this better, how can I make it more efficient, they're going to really be able to hear that voice and make it happen. So what I've tried to do throughout this whole process is keep applying these lean UX principles, once again, to get out. And so that think, um, make, and create. And so this is a process we've done. Um, I've, everyone does something very similar, whatever. But as I've developed our products um, through the years, we've got three of them. Um, we've always gone through a discover phase and so on and so forth. In the discover phase, we always went through job-based research to understand what is really needed there. Um, but what we've done on top of that is really take that lean UX and apply it at every single stage. What I've seen happen a lot is that the lean UX sometimes doesn't get applied till later on down here. And so you're doing surveys, you're doing things, you're not out there touching the customer sometimes really, really early on, or sometimes I see people are touching them really, really early on, they think they have all the information, and then they're not getting out there at the end. And so what I wanna go through tonight is just show you at each of these stages what we did to get out of the office, but in a way that was lean because of course, developing software for the education market, there's not a lot of money. <laughs> and so we had to be really, really frugal in the way we did it and make choices about when is it we spend our money and when is it we don't. So um, some of the things we did, um, in the early on the Discover phase, um, the last two summer, the last two summers, but a summer ago, um, we brought, we knew we needed to t really talk to students. Okay, because so many times people talk to teachers or superintendents and say, what is it your students need? We wanted to design from the ground up. What is it the students really need to learn? How is it that they learn? How is it that they approach learning? What is it that they need? So we brought students into, we had kind of an open area in our um, office that they weren't using. And so I created a lab setting in there and we set up simulated classrooms. We brought the kids in and we gave them problems to solve. If you had to create an app that helped you in school, what would you do? And that's all we said. We gave them white paper, we gave them big whiteboards, put them on teams or whatever, and they went at it all day long and then ended up creating for us. And we were able to observe how their thinking and process went in doing that and watched how they begin to think and learn and so forth and so on. Um, we also set up simulated environments where they were in a classroom and one of us was a teacher. And then we watched how they interact, how they do that type of stuff. And so we, what we needed to understand is that what is it that they need to learn today? How is it they need to learn? Um, what we also did in the definition phase is we did paper prototypes. So we also brought in, after we understood how a student wants to learn, needs to learn, how they solve problems, we then um, brought in a lot of teachers in focus groups and did a lot of paper prototyping with them. Because we needed to understand how is it that they then build instruction for how those students need to learn. Okay, and so we wanted to watch them do this. And what was really interesting is it's almost like creating a piece of artwork. Because as when I talked to our engineers, they were saying, I bet it's just very linear. You know, they come up, they have a problem, they do this, they do this, they do this. And as we watch them, it's like a piece of artwork. It's very cyclic in that they start with something, they change it up, they move it around, and they bring something else in. And so there is no place to start and no place to end, which was a really tough problem thinking about how do we design an application that doesn't have a starting point and doesn't have an ending point. And so, but at the same time, give someone guidance as they walk through it. So after we went through that in this definition phase, we then did a lot of digital prototyping. So we have the opportunity. So, so far we've just brought people to our office, but we brought them in the office and kind of created environments in which they could somewhat feel comfortable. Then we decided during this definition phase, we put together digital prototypes and we went out to conferences and we got rooms and stuff or whatever where they could come to us. They could come in with their peers and they could end up having discussions about 
what they would do what, at certain points. And what was really gratifying is that people would, they kept saying over and again, no one has asked us this before. Everyone just assumes they know what we want to do. And so being able to have them talk and talk with their peers, we were really able to kind of really peel them back and discover what is it that they were um, really needing to do. So went through that. And then we went into this design and development stage. Um, we did more classroom simulations. Um, but this time, rather than having it in our office, we found school buildings that allowed us to come in during the summertime and use their computer labs. Because we figured that there's a lot different ways people act when they come out of their environment into another environment, even if we set it up just like a school would look. And so we got teachers to volunteer who were real teachers, and we got students to come in and then set up where they had to have, just like they were doing an assignment in a class. But it wasn't, once again, it was a little bit more expensive for us, but not as much as you know, it could be. So each stage as we went through this, how can we be as lean as possible with the hypotheses that we need to find out, but then find out what is their behavior in a normal setting? And so um, going through that, you know, we were able to really learn a lot. And then finally, when we got to the point where we have kind of drilled this down into, we kind of kept kind of zeroing in on what this opportunity is, then we started taking um, field trips. Let's see, did I already do this one? So this is where the fun part comes in. So this, at this point, now we've got a live product. It's out there, an MVP. It's out there, you know, kind of in an alpha stage. Um, we've got, you know, we're working with Gaslight. We've got the product really out there, and we think we've got it down to where it really needs to be. In the earlier phases, when we did a lot of classroom simulation, we would have someone use a product for a week, and then we'd get on Skype with them, and the kids and the teachers would talk to us about what they need to know. But now we've actually launched it, and they're using it. And what was most effective is that we took the entire team, all the developers, all the designers, the product owners, got in a van and drove to the school down in North Carolina and spent the entire day there. And walking inside of there and watching, have the developers watch. And um, it was really good. Um, the Gaslight wrote a blog on it, what their experience was. There was about four of them, five of them that went. And they said they've never had the opportunity to actually watch someone use their app you know, in such a setting like that. And so when we went down there, we had you know, like a dozen things we wanted to find out about hypotheses, which if we did it in the normal way, it probably would have taken us months of iterations to come back. But within five minutes, we all spread out and could ask each of these students the same question. And within 10 minutes, we knew exactly what we needed to do when we came back. Then we went and we had another hypothesis, asked a bunch and watched and observed or whatever. So when we came back, we knew exactly what needed to be changed. And in fact, on the drive back, <laughs> we were already talking about where we're going to change it, what we're going to do with it. And so a week later, all these changes went out. We talked to them again. And the kids were thrilled to death because they thought they were part of this development process. And so I can't stress enough that it's not just sometimes the product owner or someone who is the responsible person or the UX person that goes out is getting that whole development team to go out there. Because when you're sitting at that table, when you're all having those discussions, and as we all know, and you know, we're doing things agile, you don't want to do all this documentation, but having that ability to have that communication and everyone's on the same page because they've all experienced it with their eyes and their ears, it's just um, the most beneficial thing ever in, in making that happen. Yes? Yeah. No, and I don't know if it was just the team we worked with at Gaslight, but I would say what I felt when I worked with the developers a lot or whatever, they were always wanting to know how they could find out this answer. And so I think as soon as they experienced 
how quickly and gratifying they could feel that, um, that they were um, very helpful about it. In fact, I was at a um, meetup last week, a lean startup one, and someone was talking to me. They said they have a real hard time getting their developers out because they're afraid that someone will talk bad about what they've done and stuff, whatever. But I tell her, I said, if you get them out there and talk to them and have them see that they can get feedback right away, it's going to really give them the boost that they want. <clears throat> and I, I told her the reason this is, I mean, that we've done a ton of research with this on students and teachers. And so the d process that we developed in this application is that the sooner a student gets feedback, the sooner that you can help them deviate to, for learning. And I believe the same thing happens with all of us. I mean, as a developer, the sooner they get feedback on whether or not something is working in the code, they get gratification in that. And I think they understand quicker and better about what's going to work. I don't, um, Kevin, would you like to come out here? <laughs> Kevin was one of the developers that went with us. And so when, I, when we proposed this, I said, you know, like, we want to have you guys go there. I was adamant that developers had to go and stuff or whatever. And so, I mean, literally, we rented a van. We all got in. We took a road trip. It was a 10-hour road trip down there. Yeah. We all had, you know, what we knew we were going to test when we got down there. And so if you want to talk about the experience. Yeah. Yes. No, I mean, you asked a question about developers not wanting to go. And, and you're right. Like, there is, there is sort of a, it can be scary to, like, go and launch users to actually use your software because they, you will see immediately the mistakes you made that you never even thought about. Like, I mean, it was crazy how we would, you know, it's the simplest button to, like, we put to, to, like, answer this question. And it was, we had the text there. We, we just wrote that in a five-second thing and never thought about it. And then we get down there and, like, ten kids, we watch, like, how do I answer the question? Like, what do I do? And they just look so confused. And we're like, oh, that's like... Well, I remember sometimes we, we sat and talked at the table and said, I wonder if we should do it this way or this way or this way. We'd have these really good discussions. Yeah. You went down there and within five minutes, like they, we said, should we put the title here or put the title there on the, on the buttons? Yeah. And then as soon as we all saw, they were all like, I wonder what this one is. And, you're, and you said, we've got to put it on there. Yeah. So it was like, it was, you know, yeah. it just immediately. Yeah, I mean, if, I mean, for the developers in the room and for anyone who wrote software, like, I, mean, I can't stress enough that, that Getting to actually watch your software be used in the field is like, I mean, it's, it's better than any, you know, any number of hours sitting in front of a computer screen. Will not tell you how you really use it, you're really going to use your app. So, so, Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, the, okay. The other thing I want to stress here on the last part on deliver, I think. What we have now understood to happen is because we have gotten out of the office so much and really understood what we need to do in developing it, what happens when you actually deliver the software? For us, when we're out there and now this is a new product, it's something very um, disruptive in the classrooms with what we created. And so there's this, we're struggling right now with how do we position it, how do we message to it, you know, how do we get people to take the chance on it? And so because we've gotten out and we understand what people value in this, they're doing the work for us. So what we did, we went down again to this district and we just took a ton of footage. And with no prompts or whatever, what you end up happening is when you're sitting at the table and you try to make the software to deliver a value, and you're like, how am I going to get people to understand that this is the most important thing to do? And you feel like you have to tell them. But when you see them use that, they tell you how valuable it is. And so by getting out, they're going to almost position these, what I'll call testimonials for you, because now that we've got this relationship with them, they are almost so anxious to tell us how much they love using it. And so you've kind of created that relationship with them. So because we have continued to go out and do that, we now have, I'm going to just play one of these for you. Kind of taken advantage of that opportunity and now turned it into something that we now can use as you know pre-sales materials and everything else. And so it's not just research used on the front end, but it's going to be our. Um, oh, we don't have. Shoot, I forgot we did have a little bit of sound, but that's okay. Yeah.
sound. Uh, Why won't that go up? I forgot about this part. That's okay. And it's just a, a really great okay. way Hold to on. everybody focus. All right, we're going to do this. Okay, so you probably saw on this one, it's all, you know, it's a message, it's all in one place, everything's organized, um, it, you know, it helps the kids keep pace or whatever. So as we started going out early on and started really trying to discover and do a lot of the, um, you know, understanding what they needed type of stuff, we started to hear little bits of that information. And then as the program evolved, those messages got stronger and stronger and stronger. So as a result of going out and getting the information we needed to develop the product, we also started to gather the information of how we're going to market the product. And so they then kind of told us what they thought were the most important parts that we put in a video. And so when we put this video then in, set in front of prospective clients, they get it right away. And so they know because it's speaking to them in the parts that they know that they want to have solved for them. So they have all, you know, just kind of told us what is needed to be solved in the classroom. So um, before I go on any more, I, I'd love to hear from you guys. I mean, ha have you had experience of getting out of the office and what that looks like for you guys? Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah. And, um, and so we, we did, we spent um, a semester building a proof of concept, and it started with us, like, going, finding three high school teachers, and, like, going to the classroom, and, like, watching them for a day, and then we would bring them in, and we would prototype, and build, and have them criticize it, and just kept doing it that first semester, and so, yeah, it happens so frequently, and, like, to huge budgets, $22 million, I don't even know what that looks like. Yeah. And it was, didn't work at all. Not even a neat little bit. So. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I work for Organized Living. So our, our corporate headquarters, we make storage and organization products. Um, our headquarters is here in Cincinnati, and that's where our development team is. But our factory is in Bloomington, Indiana. And that's, and a lot of the software that we write has to be used by people in our warehouse or people who are on the factory floor. And so um, last year, uh, we sent out uh, two of our developers to Bloomington for the day uh, for them to spend the whole day with the people that they're writing warehouse and accounting software for. And it was hugely valuable. It's still, still paying off uh, mm -hmm. benefits because whenever we're creating something of, okay, here's how you track the UPS packages or whatever, they can now visualize that, you know, the person that they're writing that for is in the middle of this huge warehouse with all these boxes and trucks going all around them and using these old dusty computers. I mean, it really gave them a, a very concrete sense mm -hmm. of who their users are. And, um, and it also built good relationships, so now, um, you know, something I've seen since then is that my team and the people in Bloomington are a lot more comfortable with picking up the phone and just talking through problems with each other because they now have that face-to-face -face relationship. Whereas before, they were just names on an email and they didn't really have that, mm -hmm. that knowledge about who each other was. So what part of the process? Was it more in the, the kind of the discovery phase where you sent them out or was it more when you already had a prototype? Uh, it was in the discovery phase. It was actually um, right after we finished a big project and we knew that a lot of the work we were going to be starting on was going to involve the factory people. And so it was in that in-between time mm -hmm. we said, okay, now we need to really... Have you sent them back out again after they started using it? Um, you know, we haven't yet. That's, um, you know, that'd probably be it would be good. This year. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? Yes.
Yeah. Anybody else? Um, the other thing we did too was at the beginning when we started some of the earlier phases, we, you know, we used experience mapping and those types of things to actually collect the information. And then we used those experience maps as ways in which we could test those as we went out in the further phases. Um, has anyone used, you know, like how do you collect information when you go out and you work with users? How do you collect and kind of um, communicate that information to what I'll call internal stakeholders or the other team? Because early on, you know, some of the research was done by some of us more of the product owners and we didn't involve the development team until we got a little bit further down. So we had to have a way to visually communicate some of the information that we were initially gathering so that they could become um, embedded in it. Um, what are things have you guys used in um, kind of collecting or putting that information together in which to communicate? Has anyone used experience maps or journey maps? Okay. Um, if you, I would recommend it highly. I mean, there's um, what we did for experience maps is we did, you know, we talked to, you know, students, teachers, we all stakeholders, you know, the first, second, third level degree. But what we really tried to work out in there is what were the functions that need to happen along there and what were their emotions that they were feeling as they were able to have that function satisfied or not satisfied. So it allowed us to understand where were the biggest pain points for opportunity in, these, in this application that we're building. And so it really helped us a lot as we were deciding how to build this application, where is the biggest area of risk. And so we may want to start in that area of development and so, for instance, like with putting this tool out there where teachers could build, use something to build a lesson with, building a lesson was pretty much understood. There wasn't a whole lot of risk there. Getting the pieces and putting it together, that wasn't that big of a risk. Where our biggest risk was, because of what this application needed to do, was it was connecting the teacher, the student, and the content in an active learning space so that a teacher had a window into how the student was thinking as they were learning. But for that to happen, a teacher had to be able to provide feedback to the student at the point they were learning. So we needed to understand what was the tolerance level of a teacher to be able to be that closely connected with a student when they're used to going home having a set of papers to grade and they were totally disconnected from the student. Even though in their heart they knew the best thing to be was with that student to help them learn, but it was you know, kind of challenging their behavior of what they normally did. And so there was a lot of, am I going to be connected to this computer 24-7 to have to do feedback? So we needed to understand what was the tolerance level before they would say, I quit, I'm not doing this anymore, or was it such a benefit to my students to get that feedback right when they were learning and I would know immediately if they got it or not and I wouldn't have to wait till the test two weeks later. And so that's where we did a lot of this testing. So that point there was the biggest area of risk. And so what we did was kind of simulate a lot of this for them, and then we tested a lot of stuff here, and then you know, once we understood what they needed to do there, then we could build out the other pieces. So I think it also helped us figure out, if those of you are familiar with that, you know, that, that skeleton that you need to build first when you're building a new application, where is it that you need to build it end to end, and where do you start going deep for your biggest areas of risk? So um, I think some of those things like a journey map, an experience map, helps you when you do these different tests, kind of gather that and put it in a visual representation so you can communicate to your team and then keep testing that. And so what was interesting when we went out on that field trip, we had this experience map to go with us. And I remember a couple of the developers said, I remember when we did all that and we were talking about how a teacher was so stressed for time in having to find all these resources. And when I sat there and heard them say it and watched them kind of struggle with that, they said, you know, now it all makes so much sense. And so it just kind of really clarified it for them. So I think using tools like that kind of really helps you kind of um, put all that together too. So any other comments? Yeah. Do I have what? Um, I could probably find it on my computer, yeah. Do we bring it up? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got it out there. Yes? We didn't even have the application built at that time. So it was really on. Like 
No, we, our, our question was, what is it a teacher needs to do to build instruction? And what is it a, te a student needs to do to learn from instruction? And so, you know, we took the map all the way from how I begin to understand the standards and everything else that I need to do, to, but our app didn't start way back there. But we needed to understand the whole journey and then where was the part that our app could really help with? Because you know, there's no way we could do the whole thing. And so you know, we talked to them and then when we found a lot about this part over here, they were somewhat satisfied with what they were already doing. And over here on this part, the grading and stuff, they were already satisfied with what they were doing there. But this building part and working with the students and stuff here, when we did a lot of job-based research to understand what is it that's most important to happen and how satisfied are you with that, they were saying it's so important to do that and they were so not satisfied. So then that kind of told us right here where we needed to work and stuff. So, anybody else? Yes? How are we measuring the success of the application? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a really cool story. Um, we just have a great relationship with this one district. And so they have used this, and they are a one-to-one -one district. Um, they're a phenomenal district. Their, district. their superintendent won superintendent of the year two years ago. Obama's gone and visited them. I mean, they are someone that's out there on the forefront of really pushing digital instruction. And so they're not new to this whole everyone trying to get them to tr you know, work with a new application. But they said they're always trying to strive to get these kids to keep doing something new because they have to keep challenging them. And the same thing with their teachers. They want to keep challenging their teachers. And they have this thing called, um, oh, I'm not going to remember this, e ET, ET something or whatever. It, it, it measures the effectiveness of a teacher, which in essence measures the effectiveness of how the students learn type of thing. And over the last few years, they've been kind of consistent with it. And we had the fifth grade and the sixth grade and some of the fourth grade use this application as the sole way to do math instruction and language arts instruction. At the end of the school year, the teachers you know, were evaluated, they always do, and a good majority of the teachers, their ratings went up like 200%, I mean like just outrageously amount. And they've gone back and tried to figure out the only thing we changed this year was using this application. So we really dug down and figured out what is it in the application that made that happen. And what it really was is it gave the teachers a platform in which to collaborate and talk and to build instruction. So it's almost like it kind of provided for them the means in which to do something they've been always wanting to do. But there was never a way for them to easily come together to collaborate because it was always paper and pencil. Everyone had different schedules. So this allowed them, they could all sit at home and kind of collaboratively do it together. They could come on and, you know, someone starts, someone would end. This tool allows them to build lessons together, so one person can add, it's just like a Google Doc, and it kind of all adds it in there. And so we didn't set, we set out to try something to help students, but in the end, it was helping the teachers be more effective, which in the end helps the students have progress, whatever. So there's things like that that we're beginning to understand now that um, statistics are showing us that, but it's hard in a school because there's so many factors that come into play as to how well someone learns. Um, but I think things like that kind of really, giving people the opportunity to kind of work together and collaborate, which is what they've been trying to do, but they were always hurdles in the way to get that done. So, so. anything else? Yeah. Yeah. We have not, but I'm sure I know there's a lot of people that do. I'd say what we used it for was more of the journey to get there. So it was, a, it was the means in which to bring our team together so that we all had that shared understanding. As a result of what we ended up with, you know, we, we would look at it, whatever, and then we'd go out and do testing. We'd kind of go back and kind of validate if this is what was happening. But we didn't use it to that granular level. It was more about it was the journey to get us all on that same page yeah. and stuff. So. Yeah.
We never stop validating. Yes. Yes. Before you start. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, this has really gone on for, I'd say, almost two and a half years. But we were, I'd say, we were, at the very beginning of this, stuck in that um, analysis paralysis for a while because we didn't have a development runway. And so we did a whole lot of job-based research and that type of research up front. And then finally when we had the funding available, then we could go in and get into more of the development phase. But um, the validation, um, I mean, it's kind of like, if you think of, I always thought of it as a big old funnel. At the beginning, the validation was on very broad subjects to kind of start to narrow down where we needed to be. And then as we went through the phases, this funnel kept getting more narrow and more focused and more focused. So at the end, what we were testing was very, very specific. Like when we went out there, I mean, it was very specific. Is this gonna help the students if it has a title on this or not? Is the colors on the buttons, how important that is to, the, to communicate to the student where they are in this progress? As opposed to when we first started, it was, you know, what does a teacher need to be able to build a lesson? And it came down to they need questions, they need resources, and they need something in which to put those together. You know, so it was, it was broad, and then we just kind of kept narrowing it down. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. Yes? It's hard. I'd say, um, and I mean, I, I come from a very small company, so I don't know if you're from an agency or from some, where you have a bunch of different projects. But the company I came, that I work in right now, it was, um, it's been there since 99, and so it was very much waterfall approach. And so where our struggle was, was kind of getting that mindset moved or whatever. And so many times, people would revert back to, oh, well, we know what needs to be done. We'll just do this or whatever. And it was just this constant battle of, no, we don't. We have to get out. And so we have to get out. And so what I did early on is I developed a, I'll call it a database of users. And so, you know, very early on, I was constantly sending teachers emails to say, will you be part of a group when we ever need to do this? And teachers, God love them. And I, I mean, I was a teacher too or whatever. But, you know, I, I do want to honor their time. So we always did something simple like a $25 Amazon gift card. They... I mean, just for, but they love the ability just to be able to put their voice into the product or whatever. So over time, I built up probably four to 500 names that I could constantly at any point in time go out. So no matter where we were in this process, and I know many times we sat at the table and it was like, okay, we need to get this validated. Do you think they would want this or this? We could immediately get online with somebody, sometimes Skype them, sometimes send out or get, they'd get a couple screenshots together, Mark would wireframe something together. Do we want this or this? And we could get validation back right away. But it was important that we had people that we talked to that were not familiar with the process, so they had kind of that neutral input, and people that were very familiar, so we could kind of get their input from knowing what it has been able to do so they could keep pushing us forward. So I would just, and in the same time, I mean, we had no money. I mean, there's no money for this validation, but just finding those users that will want to participate and kind of put their voice in. And so that's why early on, um, the only thing I could talk the company into was I held a camp, you know, my, stu my um, Novation Lab Day, and I said, I remember when my kids would go to camps and stuff or whatever, so parents love to drop the kids off for six hours. <laughs> and so what we did is we gave a tour of our office and kind of talked to them about, okay, this is what you could do when you could grow up. And here's what a designer do does all day. Here's what a um, programmer does all day. Here's what other people do. And so I had parents, each time we did this, I had parents call me and say, you, I mean, what they, this child experience, they come home and now they want to be a developer and stuff. <laughs> and so, and then, do you remember when we were at um, Mooresville, these kids have this computer or their, um, what is it, their um, computer camp or their after school camp or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And they're learning like a meetup. Meet they learn Ruby, Rails, JavaScript, and these kids are fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. 
they were, and so I said, okay, do you, these guys, I said, you guys, these are developers and designers. This is what they do every day. And they said, they were asked, like, what do you sit on? What, what's it look like? What do you do? And I mean. Let's see if you can picture your office. Yeah. But they wanted to know questions. They said, you know, like, would, should I be a Ruby or should I be a Java program? I mean, they were asked these questions, and you're like. You're in fourth grade. Yeah. Ruby <laughs> won when you graduate So, yeah. The reason I brought that up is that I always feel, e even when you're asking something of a user here, if there's a way that we can honor them and kind of give them something back. And so, you know, a lot of times I think we were able to t help them understand what's next for you, you know, what could you be when you grow up type of thing. And then they wanted to be part, because they felt like they were getting some out of this too. We weren't just taking all the time. We wanted to kind of always give back. And so, so I think, you know, sometimes then if you can find stuff like that, um, that helps. Yeah. And I, I'm just going to throw in there, it's, when we first started doing this, it was really easy. You know, a lot of people think that doing user testing is this real dominant thing. You can do all the setup, and you got to like survey people. You really don't. Like, you can fire up Skype, and just share your screen and give, you can like do the mouse thing where somebody, somebody else can control your computer and you just throw up your local post 3000 web, web site up there mm -hmm. and they'll just click around on it and you can just watch your screen as they click around see, mm -hmm. what's, see what's working and what's not working. And we did, when we were first starting out, we did a really good job, I think, of every week we just, the screen we built today, the next day we would just spend an hour and throw it in front of three people and just have them click around it mm -hmm. and ask them if it was confusing or if it made sense. So yeah. That, that really, really helped. Yeah. And I think the other thing, too, that we found, too, early on, when you've got your it's a bigger part of this funnel and you're not real sure, we were kind of fearful of, do we know the right answer? So how many people do we need to talk to to make sure we have the right answer? So early on, the surveys, the people we talked to were larger groups. But I truly believe that statistics that you only need five people to find the answer. And because when we did a larger set, we would get to the same answer as when we did some, just three, four, five people. It's, it really, really is true. I mean, from what we found, it really is true. So, anything else? Yes? Uh, so I might be an extreme case of this, but my user base is located entirely in India. India, okay. Is there, are there any tools or any ways uh, where I could still be able to interact with them and figure out what they're, you know, what they're doing in their day to day without physically being yeah. uh, there. A early on, I used a tool called Silverback. Have you ever used Silverback? Silverback's a really cool tool. It's, um, it only works on a Mac, which is fine, because Macs are great. But it, um, <laughs> it, um, it, it, what it does is um, you set up this site, and then you put your website, so they, they, they click on it. And it records their face, which is so important to see their visual reaction. You tell them, t talk what you're hearing in your head. I'm going to go here, I'm going here, whatever. And then it also tracks what they do with the mouse and their clicks. And so you get back this kind of combined um, file, I guess. And so it feels as if you were just sitting right there. And so what you see is you're seeing their screen and you're seeing their little picture up here. And so you can really kind of put all that together. Um, so that worked for us a lot. I think. We um, also used um, Deep Analytics, which yeah. is uh, it's like Google Analytics. You can follow a user as they go through the app and see what they're clicking on and watch. It'll actually do some of the regeneration of yeah. like the buttons they click on and show you the screen they want to. Yeah. It's a little bit more, it's not, it's not as fine grained as something like that, right. but it helps, especially if you have a lot of active users. Yeah. Another product we used early on was Crazy Egg. I don't know if you've used that one. And that one, um, it, we didn't use that at the end because it doesn't give you by user, but it gives you heat maps. So when we were trying to find out, um, we didn't use it on our other product, but trying to find out, you know, is this, you know, menu even being used? Where are they going? It, it does a lot of heat maps and where they're doing on there. So that was helpful. Uh, crazy Egg. Yeah. There's lots of great tools out there and stuff. Um, yeah, but I mean, honestly, just, I mean, we would just do Google Hangouts, Skype, and you just hand it to them. And stuff, and they, um, you know, just w just watch them or whatever. The biggest thing for me is I would just tell them. At first, they were uncomfortable. Just talk what's in your head. 
just tell me what you're thinking. And so you'd have to ask those questions that weren't leading, but enough to just kind of say, now tell me what you're doing next. And then they just kind of get into the rhythm of that, and they just kind of talk out loud. Yeah, you just ask them a simple question, right? If you've got a screen that's like a lesson for us, we have like a lesson creation screen. And create a lesson, type in the title, and like start going. And we would just ask them, like, OK, here's the screen. Like, go create a lesson. Right? How do you think you would create a lesson? Mm -hmm. What do you think you would click to add a resource to this lesson? And it's pretty clear when they would not know immediately what to say. Mm -hmm. Some things, you know, it's interesting how some things that you thought would be really challenging were just totally intuitive, and some things that you thought were totally intuitive were just, they had nothing to do Yeah. Yeah. So it's, anybody else? Okay. I hope this was helpful. I know it's, you know, I know the software we develop sometimes is not as mainstream. Everyone's probably a lot more, I don't know, other types of applications, but I think it applies. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, even if you're building internal apps that are mm -hmm. like, you know, your internal B2B systems that are only used by inside your company, like still, if it's one person that uses that app, sit with them for like an hour and just watch them use it. Even if you just don't say anything, just sit there and watch them. You will learn tons of stuff about mm -hmm. how they're using it. Yes. Um, so one of the questions I have is how do you so user testing, it does take time, and you also have um, business deadlines that are being pushed and trying to get things turned around on a tight deadline. How do you make the, the business case to uh, slow down and spend some time testing and, uh, I guess, make room for mm -hmm. that? I'd say, I would say the only time we totally stopped was when we took the field trip. Other than that, the way we could line it up is that we were always, you know, one or two weeks ahead. And so we were testing something that was being done, but then they were starting to work on the, you know, Mark already had it lined up to start the next part. And then as that was starting to be tested, then we, we would come back with what we found out from this, and then that would be put in there. And so you always kind of just had this thing that you could walk down. But at the same time, too, we never, because Gaslight's so disciplined with us, we, you never pl planned out too far than a couple weeks. Because if you went out too far, something you found here was going to necessarily change the stuff that you had thought you were going to do two weeks out. And so we only just usually had about two weeks, you know, your current week and the next week planned out. And we had, and then Mark and I, who was the product owner, you know, we would do other high level plans to say, we're probably going to do this. And then we would kind of do some of our, maybe a little bit of discovery on ourselves to kind of figure out which would be more important that we should work on first. But when we're working here, it was really just kind of this. And to, I mean, when you're trying to pitch this to higher, you know, higher ups or people who are running the business, making business decisions, like, I mean, you just have to pitch it to them. It's like, do you want an app that people like using, or do you want a piece of crap that nobody's going to use and you have to sell? Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's usually pretty good yeah. motivation. Yeah. No, and I think, but the other thing we did too is we also had, you know, you have your um, retrospectives with your team or whatever, but we would have a retrospective with, you know, the, the, high, you know, the executives at the company. And so they came to the meeting with, you know, their business needs to have this thing done here. And so when we involved them in this and they were able to see the progress that was made and they also had input as a user, it was that same type of thing because we were also honestly really testing with them to kind of see if, what they needed to get out there and sell was something, was there enough in the product for them to get out there and start doing the selling of it? So we had to balance what is it that the customer needed? What is it that te was technically feasible? What is it that the business absolutely had to have in there so they could start selling it? And it was kind of a, um, a triad that you had to kind of always be working with. So I think involving them, um, or, you know, throughout this whole process. And so we always, we did testing a lot. We had testing internally with, the sales team, and so they had to walk yeah, through that too. Yeah, because they were internal to us. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. Challenges with. Okay, there's, um, 
I would say, it, if I'm understanding your question correctly, says so there any ta challenges working with the teachers? And so um, some schools, you had, we had to work hard because when, when I started doing this probably about three, four, five years, about five years ago, whatever, there was a huge resistance. You're not allowed to come into our building because this is classroom time. We are not going to waste this, you know, helping out a business type of thing. And so a lot of what I, the work I did early on was to help them understand what iteration and agile development was and how important it was to get that voice of the customer early on so that we could deliver what they needed. So there was some, I would say, helping the user understand this process because they were a little resistant to it because that market, probably like many other markets, expect the product to be done when they purchase it. They don't expect it to be continually be iterative as they go out. And so I don't want it to have my teachers have to learn something again. But when we got them to understand that it's evolving, then it worked with them. So there was that challenge we had, and I would say the other challenge is that you had, it's just classrooms themselves. You get everything set up. When we went down there that one time, all of a sudden, the superintendent was supposed to meet with us, then had a meeting with someone else. And then there was the fire drills in the classroom. And then, it was, you know, so it's like, we had, you just had to go down and knew you were going to be nimble. And so we just set up a lot of contingency plans. If we can't get these classrooms, we'll get these classrooms. And so we had to do a lot of contingency plans. And we knew, we overplanned that we were going to go to, I think, 15 classrooms. And we ended up going to maybe like eight. But that still was a ton of information that we were able to come back with. Yeah, and especially doing user testing, like, um, you know, you, you're just naturally going to get users who are more familiar with technology and, than other users. And so it's, it's, it's a little bit tough to, like, what, what target audience are you going for? Are you going for the people who are really clueless about technology and have, like, trouble using a mouse? Or are you going to go for, like, the super advanced users that you don't, you know, you're just going to go for the power users? And that was always a challenge because we... We definitely wanted to like be in the middle of the road and have that be as broad as possible, but you, you also don't want to go too far one way because if you make it too simplified, it's, you know, you're hurting the people that really want to push it at the, at the front. So, yeah. so that, that, was, that was a challenge for sure. Yeah, but it was all fun, all right. very fun. Any other questions? Um, the only thing I, other thing I wanted to share on Gaslight Sight, they have, um, they did a case study. So if you're interested at all about what this product is and kind of what we did when working with Gaslight, they did a great job doing a case study um, and kind of talk through how this was, what our development and what our partnership was together. And then um, Michelle, who also works at Gaslight, she was on this road trip with us and did an amazing blog mm -hmm. through the eyes of, you know, a development team, what it was like to go watch users use your app. Um, and so on Gaslight's... Um, yeah, if you go to the, uh, you can see this on our, on our work section, if you go to the blog and just search for Innovation or Icario. Yeah, or just, yeah, watch, yeah. Oh yeah, there it is, right there. It was, um, she did it in May, June, it was like yeah. sometime in the summertime, yeah. 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 March 6th. Yeah. March 6th. March 6th. <laughs> there you go. That's, oh, that's, is it right there? Okay, there it is. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.